السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته كيف حالكم جميعا يا أيها الأخوة وأخواء وأيها الصائمون والصائمات بيأكس الله سبحانه وتعالى to accept our fast and to allow us to be eager and obtaining and catching the blessed night of Laylatul Qadr since we are at the end of the month of Ramadan الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق لينهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إقرار به والتوحيد وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم تسليما مزيدا أما بعد Brothers and sisters, it is not unknown to all of us that the Prophet وسلم, he said in the tremendous hadith that is narrated on the authority of Abu Hurairah عنهم, who mentioned that إِذَا دَخَلَ شَهْرُ رَمَضَانِ that when the month of Ramadan enters, he said فُتِحَتْ أَبَوَابُ السَّمَاءِ that the heavens or the doors of the heavens are, doors of the heaven are open وَغُلِقَتِ الْأَبَوَابُ جَهَنَّمِ and the doors of the hellfire are closed وَسُسِلَتِ الشَّيَوْقِينِ and that the devils are locked down. The scholars have explained from this hadith that when it say the shayateen are locked down or are chained down, that does that excludes the human devils. That excludes the human devils and they say that the worst of the devils are locked down or that the evil and the extent of their evil are lessened in this month. Allah knows best. But without a shadow of a doubt, the human devils, the shayateen amongst the ants, are still rampant. They are still running around. And unfortunately, uh, and sad that the month of Ramadan did not lock down all of the devils. And what we mean here about the shayateen amongst the ants, as we seen in that um, horrible uh, incident that have taken place about a week or so now, and has run rampant and has been running live with the sister of misguidance. And we'll get into the reason why we say the sister of misguidance. Uh, in the corrupt, uh, the commotion and the fitna that was steered with the Dawah Center up there in Germantown. Um, and we will use the words of the actual sister herself in explaining the incident and so forth. But we want to address this issue. Unfortunately, we have to because, like we said, there are Shia queens amongst ants that are still rampant even in the month of Ramadan. And whenever we see something that is wrong, should if we have the ability to speak out against it we have the ability to change with our hands and we have the ability to speak out against it and at the very least hate it in our heart and we should do something about it and this is not clout chasing this is not fame so I'm not going to miss it mention the sister name this is not to bring any light to the sister or to make her more famous than what she already is uh, however this is to clarify the matter my intention with this is to clarify the matter to us Muslims and to clarify to the common Muslims of the times that we live in. And so I'm going to start my talk with the statement of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said, Yahruju fi akhir al zaman. He said, Kala kala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, The Messenger of Allah said, Yahruju fi akhir al zaman. Qawmun ahdathu al asnan. Ahdathu al asnan. Sufahau al ahlam. Yakra'un al Quran. La yujawizu. He said that the, the Prophet ﷺ said that there is going to appear people at the end of time. At the end of time, close to the hour, there's going to appear a people who will be young in age. Foolish. They will be foolish, young in age, and they will recite Quran. But however, the Quran would not exceed past their throats. It would not extend past their throats. And we're getting to what the meaning of not exceed past their throats, what it meant. Um, the scholars, they explain the see past their throats, meaning they won't have the proper fahm, the proper understanding of the Quran. And we know that this is also another characteristic of what group? The first deviant group to ever appear in Islam is what we know as who? The Khawarj. So the Khawarj, and some say the Shia, and Allah knows best, during the time of Ali, they both appear. Um, but the Khawarij is the group that is the first known group to be deviant. 
because the Prophet ﷺ dealt with it, even they dealt with their father when they told him to be just or Muhammad. The Khawarij brothers and sisters, they one of their characteristics is that the Quran, they will recite the Quran, but it will not exceed past their throats. And this narration, the Prophet ﷺ said there will be a group of people that will appear, that will be young in age, and they will also be foolish, and they will recite the Quran, but it will not exceed past their throat. Then he continued. He said, يَمْرُكُونَ مِنَ الدِّينِ كَمَا يَمْرُكُ الصَّحْمُ مِنَ الرَّبِّيَّةِ And this is a hadith that's collected by At-Tirmidhi in the Sahih, Sahih al-Jami' uh, At-Tirmidhi collected this hadith and it, started, and, and it mentions that they will exit the deen They will leave the deen They will leave the, the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal They will exit it just like an arrow exit the target Just how when an arrow will pierce the skin and it hits the target that it wants to hit, it goes in and it goes out. That's how they will exit the deen. Now, I miss I miss something. He said something very important. He said, Ya Quran, they will recite the Quran, turaqiyahum. Okay? He said, Yakuruna min bariya. They will speak with the best, they will speak with the statements of the best of creation. They will speak with the statements of the best of creation. And this is alluding to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Khayru Kharani, the best, the best generation is my generation. Thumma ladina yalunahum, then those who come after them. Thumma ladina yalunahum, then those who come after them. Talking about those three successful generations, which is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's companions, then it's the Tabi'een, then it's the Atba'a Tabi'een, those who follow them. And they will speak with their statements. So they will recite the book of Allah, number one. They will not comprehend it. They will use the statements of the Salaf, right? And they will beautify themselves with the statement of the Salaf. But yet and still, they will exit from the deen. This is a tremendous statement. We don't have time to go too deep in it. But I wanted to start that off with this conversation, inshallah ta'ala. The sister of misguidance, she have done something, brothers and sisters, that with this incident that took place, she has done something which we call, with this commotion, is called fitna. In her words, she quote, that she was having an altercation or she was having a discussion with a sister, rather, who attends the Germantown Masjid. And the sister that she was having this conversation with uh, invited her to come back the next day to speak to some more knowledgeable people than her. Uh, with some of the concerns that she might have if she can go to the Dawah go to the Dawah Center and address that issue there. The sister in her own words said when she came around like two o'clock, everyone was aware of her coming. And when she got there, she went in and that the two brothers who was already there, it was kind of hostile, etc. etc. towards her or whatever. She mentioned it. She said it was actually hostile towards her and they were telling her you cannot be here, we know who you are, you have to leave, etc. Then she said, this time, Hassan Somali pulls up, he gets out of his car, and he goes in. So she follows Hassan Somali back into the, and this time it's about seven brothers, and it's just her and her cousin, who happened to be quote unquote Salafi, that's in the car. I don't know, he came out at some point uh, to the Dawah Center. And she was talking to Somali, and she was mentioning that I was told to come here, and you know, so forth like that, and Somali, engaged her, he had a little discourse with her. She said she mentioned to Somali about the verse in Surah Taha. Okay, she mentioned to Somali about a verse that comes in Surah Taha, the fifth ayah. Okay, where Allah talks about his istawa ala arsh. Al Rahman istawa ala arsh. Okay? Well Allah mentioned that calling himself the most merciful istawa ala arsh. She said that we are talking about this verse. And she said, I asked Hassan Sulman. She said, I asked him, where was Allah before the Arsh? Where was Allah before the Arsh? And she mentioned this because this was a point she was trying to, I guess, she was trying to make. She said that I asked him this three times and he kept giving the incorrect answer. He kept saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was above, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was above his creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was above creation. She said this was incorrect. Brothers and sisters, this talk is not really about her. She's upon misguidance. Anyone who holds these type of beliefs or thoughts are upon misguidance. And the reason why I say this, and I'm not speaking or just trying to place a hook on somebody, is because we have been taught from our self. 
and we're going to use the famous hadith of Abdullah, we're going to use the famous hadith of Imam Malik. A man came into the masjid, and if y'all don't know about Imam Malik, he's one of the four Imams, and he's also one of the Imams who was actually, at that time, they used to call him the, the, the Imam of, uh, of, of the Haramain of, uh, of, of Medina. He was the Imam of Medina. A man came to the masjid where Imam Malik was at, and he asked Imam Malik a question. He asked him about, he said, Kaifa istawa. He asked him about the istawa of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Imam Malik, as the scribe, had placed his head down. He said he put his head down for a long period of time. He did not respond immediately. I want you to pay attention to this narration. This is very important, especially for us. Whenever we deal or confront it with people like this, with these shubahat or these shubha, then we, know, we need to know how to respond. And what they mean mentioned in this explanation to Akita wa Satiya, he explains this narration is the format on how we deal with anything in regards to Allah attributes, his names, and any tenets of faith. Then this is how we respond to these individuals. When he finally raised his head, he was sweating. He Malik was sweating. So that lets you know that the question was serious. To let you know that he did not automatically respond or immediately reply. This was a serious question for what purpose? And we're going to see at the end why it was so serious. When he finally responded, he told the man, he said, This He said that the istawa of Allah is what? It is well known. It is something that is known. It's not something that is hidden from the creation. The istiwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is well known. He said, wajibun. And the belief in it is obligatory. Obligatory for whom? Every man and female, child, young, old, who acknowledge and said the shahada that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger and his final slave. I mean his final messenger and his servant. Everyone who professes the shahada, it is obligatory on them to believe in the istawa. Then listen to what he said next. He said, what kaifa? He said, what kaifa? What kaifa who? Majroon. He said, in the how of the istawa, because this is what the brother wanted, this is what the guy was asking, this is what the question was really seeking with his question. The how of it is unknown. This is the end of his statement. He was su'alu anhu bid'ah, and to ask about it. Not X, where the verse can be found. Not X, where the hadith can be mentioned. But to ask the kaif, the how the istawa is actually done, is an innovation. Then he ordered the man to be dragged out or to be thrown out. The seriousness of this question, brothers and sisters, is what we're facing with, with this incident. This particular incident is not strange to the people of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. This incident and these type of questioning is misguidance. Why did he say it is bid'ah? Because Shaykh al-Abani, rahmatullah ta'ala alayhi, he explained a beautiful point from this narration, and we call this, is, this is an incident or a report of Imam Malik. He said what we learned from this is that during the time of Imam Malik, the people, the Muslims, they was already, it was already well known about their tenets. No one questioned the, con the concept of istawa. No one asked any question before this man in that region about how the istawa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was done. So the belief was intact. So because this man was bringing now what we call a shubha to something that was never brought up, he was causing fitna. So he ordered the man to be thrown out which was a proper way of dealing with this particular individual. So Sheikh al Bani went further. He said, in that time, that was suitable and that was needed to be done, the way that the man was, was treated. But in our time, 
he mentioned. It might possibly, if it's in a region or area where the where, where the belief system of Ahlul Sunnah is not widespread, is not known amongst the masses, is not cemented amongst the masses, the masses really do not understand it fully, then we will not respond in the same manner as Imam Malik did by throwing that person out if they was to ask the same questions. What does this teach us? It teaches that number one, there is a golden rule when dealing with Amit and Nas, brothers and sisters, please pay attention to this. There is a golden rule when dealing with the common people. There is a golden rule, Sheikh Waslam and Taymiyyah mentioned. He said, when it comes to the common people, the rule of thumb is that أَكْثَرُهُمْ جُحَادٌ That the majority of them are ignorant. When he say juhal here, he's talking about jahl. What do he mean? He means jahl and the deen Allah. They are ignorant about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are ignorant about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't understand the sharia in total like a scholar or a tulab that is strong, mutamakkin. So we do not assume that every person who wears a thobe or who has a beard or every person who has a jilbab or has hijab or who circulate this masjid or circulate that masjid or say the salams or extend the salams, we do not assume that they have ilm knowledge and we do not call what this sister was professing knowledge we do not say that she was debating with knowledge we do not say that she was discoursing or talking or conversating with knowledge she had information that was misinformed she had misguided information that cannot be called knowledge from the Salaf now from the best of generations the companion, the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Abdullah ibn Umar, he said what? He defined, he gave us a definition of what is ilm. He said, ilm is call a law. Call a Rasulullah. Call a la adri. Allahu Akbar. He said that knowledge, again, is the statement of Allah. That's the book of Allah. That's the hadith Qudsi. That's authenticated and traced back what? That's the hadith, those sacred hadiths. That's the Quran. He said, Qala Rasulullah is the statement of the Messenger of Allah. Those authentic, pure, unadulterated hadiths of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whether it be in statement, whether it be in his action, whether it be in his silent tax and approvals. Then he said, it's the statement, La Adri, I do not know. Saying, I do not know, is knowledge. There's a report that some of the Salaf said that the statement, La Adri, is nisfu ilm, is half a knowledge. And we see this in the narration that deals with another report that Iman Malik, a man traveled from far to ask Iman Malik a bunch of questions, and he only answered about four of them. And to the majority of his questions, he said, La Adri, La Adri. And the man said, SubhanAllah, you're Iman Malik. I traveled this far, I asked you some light matters, and you're saying, La Adri? I do not know. So, this concept of knowledge that's praiseworthy is knowledge of the deen. And that's what Allah said, this messenger said. So, the point I want to bring here, I don't want to focus so much on the fact that the sister really thought that she overcame Somali with her talk, that he did not answer properly. Actually, he did answer properly. Okay? But, the fact that she don't know, I want the masses to understand how do we deal with this stuff. It's important now because there has something to happen in the community, in Philadelphia, and in the tri-state, and even in the UK, that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our errors from amongst the people who wanted to be eager in spreading the dollar. But because we don't have proper hikmah, and we didn't really take the tutelage of those particular scholars who were elder and known and strong in their deen and their manners. We have done something that was backwards and we can see the effects now. Sheikh Tahir, and don't beat me up, I know that the, the brother don't like to be called Sheikh, I can call him Dr. Tahir, he has a right to be called Dr. Tahir, he reaches the tour, but I'm going to call him Sheikh anyway. Sheikh Tahir, and I'm not saying shaking ilm like a major shaking style on the level of Sheikh Um 
but he had preceded me in 22 years of study. He did a beautiful talk on the introduction to the Akita Wasatiya. And he said something that never left me in that class. And I, and, and I see it now, and I really see the effects of it. He said that the scholars of the past of Mahal Sunnah wa Jama'ah, they taught the they taught the creed of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah for two main reasons. He said the first reason is to establish the tenets of Iman, the tenets of the faith for the believers, so that we can know what to properly believe in. Okay? Then they said, then he said that they also, for the other reason, main reason why they taught the books of creed, is for what purpose? He said to refute the misconceptions and the innovations and those innovative ideas and those alaologies that went against the creed of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jamaah. He said the problem now, this is what he added, the problem is that we are being taught the books that were meant for rudud, for refutation, over the books that were meant for taqriya, for confirming our faith. And it shows. When that incident took place with the sisters, you have many Muslims who were confused. You have many Muslims who ascribe themselves to Salafiya. You have many Muslims who ascribe themselves to a particular master that advocates Salafiya. You have many Muslims who have in their libraries books like Akita wa Satiya, who have in their libraries books like Shah Sunnah, who have in their libraries books like Usul Sunnah. You have people who have these things and they still was flabbergasted. They still didn't comprehend. They still didn't understand. What's the problem? The problem, brothers and sisters, is what Sheikh Hassan Abana said when he visited us and what his wife said. They are all talk, dress, and they holler. We don't understand our deen. We don't understand these issues because we're worrying about refuting bid'ah. And bid'ah, brothers and sisters, is serious. And it definitely needs to be refuted. That's not what I'm saying. But when you teach books like Shah Sunnah by Imam Baba Hari to the common people, what do you get? All you get is people staying away from staying, staying away from search and so, and just engaging in their sins alone. We don't deal with them, we don't deal with them. That's all you get. You don't get the true understanding because it's not supposed to be taught before the tenets of faith. Usul al-Sunnah should be taught before you start talking about Shahr Baba Hari. The book itself had mistakes from the author. It's a book from Ahl sunnah don't get me wrong. But at the same time, it had mistakes that the author was making. And it caused a lot of chaos and problems. Why in the world is a book like Akita Tahawiyah is even translated? In the English language, can someone tell me this? Why? This is a book that the early man have explained. Like Sheikh Sali Ali Sheikh, Hafidullah. He said that this book is a book that you don't even enter into until you finish the kuliya, until you finish the college level. Then you're studying it with a professor. Why is it translated into English? Even that book has errors. It was statements that even Tahawi made that went against some of the creed or expressions that he used against Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. But why are we studying that book? And the reason why I'm mentioning that because the same sister of misguidance that we're talking about, she has a live where she has an individual. She has a, she has a, she has an individual that she's that, that she's with that he's quoting from this book Akira Tahawiyah, and he really thought he was enlightened. That he was using this to substantiate his argument and his debate that Allah is not the law does not istawa, that Allah does not have a jihad, that Allah does not have a body, etc. All foreign, 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 crazy stuff, crazy ideas that already been said by greater people than them, who have been refuted by greater people than them. But at the end of the day, these people did this. And he had this book, and I'm sitting to myself, why did they translate that book in English? Ain't none of us on that level. None of us on the level of Akita Tahawiyah. Why why are you Teaching it to the common folks again. And then you create this. This is what you create. Individuals who do not know how to combat when we are confronted with people of misguidance. And it shows in the way that we respond and the way that we act. Let's continue. There's a fundamental principle of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah that Sheikh Islam al Taymiyyah has a book that he was asked to write, brothers and sisters. I want y'all to pay attention. 
someone came to him and, and asked him for advice. They said, can you put together the creed of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah for the people of Wasid, for this town, this region known as Wasid? So that it became a famous book, famous work or treatise known as Aqidah to Wasid And so that you know, if you never studied Aqidah Wasid or ever went over the book, try, trust me, get the book. It's a masterpiece. And I'm not saying it's a masterpiece from my level of understanding. I'm talking about from the scholastic and the scholars who actually studied the book during its time and after his time, who have spoke about the level of proficiency and the accuracy of the book itself. Because I'm not a scholar of that caliber and I can't tell you that. So from their words and their praise, the book is a masterpiece. And he written the book from Zohar to Osir from his breast. I'm gonna let that sit in for a minute. He had no pages, no Quran, no book, no hadith, nothing with him but what he already had in his breast. And he written it down from Zohar to Asr, Akira wa Mentioned ayats in detail about Allah Sifat. He laid down some groundwork in the beginning of this work. And we're not going to take too long in it. We're only going to mention one principle, and it sticks. He laid down some fundamental groundwork that we can take whenever we come across or confront things like this so we can have a better understanding of our deen. The groundwork that he laid down was the statement he said, well, min al-iman billah. From having iman in Allah is al-iman bima wasafa bihi nafsa wa bima wasafa bihi rasulu min ghayri tahreefin wa la ta'atilin wa min ghayri takhifin wa la tamthilin بل يؤمنون بالله سبحانه وتعالى يقول ليس كمثل شيء وهو سبب مصير. In this passage, in this passage, he laid down a groundwork that is very fundamental. That if you hold on to it, brothers and sisters, you will not be confused. He said that from the belief in the law is having belief in whatever Allah has described Himself with. We're going to stop there. That's where we're going to stop it before I finish translating everything. From having iman on Allah is to have belief in whatever Allah have described Himself with. Who can tell you about Allah other than Himself? There's no one, brothers and sisters, you need to understand this concept. There is no one who can tell you about Allah other than Himself. No one. See, the people of Ta'atil, what they've done, the people who deny, they were so scared because they didn't want to make what we call, they didn't want to make tashbih. They didn't want to compare Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his creation because he said, Laysa kemiti shay, there's nothing like unto him. So in their extreme and their scare and their fear, what they did is they went so far, this is not my words, it's the scholars explaining this. They went so far to say that, you know what, we're not going to confirm any attribute for Allah that resembles any attributes of the creation. So that way we can fall in under, the, we don't fall under the ayat, of causing Allah to resemble his creation. So by doing this, they went to an extreme. They started denying everything. So much so that the scholar said that they denied, they denied so much that they made Allah ma'doom, wa And I'm going to explain what that means. They made Allah non existent. They said that, well, he's not above, he's not right, he's not left. He's not above the creation, he's not in the heavens, he's not here, he's not that. So in reality, he doesn't exist. Because of the extreme that they wanted to, no, they wanted, okay, they wanted to protect, they wanted to not fall into resembling the law to his creation, they went to a farther extreme. Right? You see how it works? The only balance you want to ever have is kitab wa sunnah, period. You, yes, you cannot have it in your mind. Don't come on. You cannot have in your mind that. Go ahead. Get it. You cannot have in your mind. Right. Okay. You cannot have in your mind that you know best about this deen. Sheikh Muslim and Taymiyyah said the, the the root of evil lies in placing the intellect. The akal before the text. Okay? If we would have started with books like Usul Sunnah of Imam Ahmed, we would have came across a principle that he mentioned 
that is very important, a point that he said, that he said, well, that He's talking about the Sunnah. He said the Sunnah doesn't have no analogy with any. Okay? He mentioned how the Sunnah is used to explain the Quran and how the Quran, are you? Are you? I need you to go in there, please. How the Sunnah doesn't, the Sunnah explains the Quran, and he wasn't coming for the for the pocket. Allah says, Inna anzalna dhikra. Indeed, we have sent down a surah to Nahl Allah saying, Indeed, we have sent down to the dhikr. Okay, are you go get it. He said that, that, that Allah Allah have sent down the dhikr, the dhikr meaning the Quran, and in order for you, O Muhammad, to clarify and to explain to them what it is that has been revealed to them. So, Allah has made the sunnah to be the sharih, the explainer of the Quran. And you cannot understand the Quran without the sunnah. So he said the sunnah in and of itself, it cannot have any kiyaz, it cannot have any analogy. Okay? Ayub, you have to go in there, please. He said, he said you cannot have, go in there, please. Okay? And you cannot have any acknowledge. Yes. You cannot have any acknowledge. Okay. You cannot have any analogy, okay? Nor can you have wala tutrabuhu lahal amthal. The examples you try to give, Ayub, go in there please. The examples that you try to give. You got the water right there in your hands. The, the, the example that you're trying to give. That is the cool water. Okay. The example that you're trying to give. You cannot strike analogies or parables for the for the Quran or the Hadith. Then he mentioned something after that. Wala tutraku bil wala ahwa. That the hadith, the narrations, they cannot be comprehended by just the intellect alone. Nor can they be what? By desires. hawa. He said that they are only are meant to be followed, whether you understand them fully or not, and to leave off desires. Are you please, please, are you go in there? You heard me? No, the cold water is in the refrigerator. You can go get it, but I need you to stop disturbing me, okay? Thank you. You understand? So, so uh, he's mentioning here a beautiful point that I think go over our heads and it should have been drilled into us. We should have never left this so that we would not be confused. Stop thinking you can comprehend the deen just with your intellect alone. Your intellect is limited. You're talking about things that are past your comprehension. When you're talking about Allah, that's from the ghayb, the unseen. When you're talking about the revelation, that Allah sent down in the books, when you're talking about the angels, and you're talking about the belief in the Qadr, and you're talking about the belief in the last day, these are things that are unseen, that cannot be grasped fully with your mind. Okay, yes. Okay? And what's gonna happen? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, made a point. And, and this is what I like to use. Because we're not just gonna refute the system with a bunch of ayats and refute people who think like this with a bunch of verses. Because sometimes people say what they want to say. Ya Quran, they recite the Quran, it doesn't, it doesn't go past their throat. They don't even comprehend that anyway. But Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, when he made a statement, he said, I, you, I need you to go in there. I'm going to shut the door, please. Go in there. Thank you. He says, Ayyu sama. He was asked the question, he said, Ayyu sama'in tudilluni. He said, what sky will, will cover me, will provide me with cover or stream me? He said, well, I you Aradin to Kululi. And what earth will protect me, will shelter me? If I was to say anything about the book of Allah, if I was to say anything about the book of Allah, with my opinion. I want to repeat that one more time. Because I think this go over our head. Abu Bakr, he said, what sky would shade me, would cover me, would screen me? And what earth would shelter me? Where can I go out and hide? If I was to speak about Allah's book, I, you, I need you to sit back. No, no toy, you have the phone. Go sit back, please. Then we said, don't disturb me. Oh, you're disturbing me. Yes. Okay, and what earth will what? 
What earth will shade me? Okay, Jezekiel Khan. What earth will shade me? Will cover me? Right? If I speak about Allah with my opinion. Fast forward it. Fast forward it to our time. This sister is based on her old argument off of Estella, one verse, that she don't even know that Allah mentioned in the Quran seven times Estella Allah. Over seven times in the Quran, Allah mentioned about his Estella Allah. Then she don't even know over six times, are you please? Over six times. Are you please? I need you to go in there. Alright? Are you? Please go in there. Go ahead, get it. Over six times. Six times. Allah mentioned about him being lofty and high above his creation. In the Quran. So when Somali responded to her, when she said, Where was Allah at before the throne? And he said that he was above his creation. She thought it was an incorrect answer. When in reality, it was the correct answer. But because she was already upon misguidance in Dalala, and this is for us to learn, not for her. This is really for us. We ask Allah to guide her and bring her back at me. But this is for us to learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave nothing out. Abu Bakr, the Prophet ﷺ said if he was to place his Iman on one scale and he was to place the Iman of all of the Ummah of Muhammad onto another, the Iman of Abu Bakr will outweigh the Iman of the Ummah. Anyone that talk nonsense like this, that speaks about Allah's book, that speaks about Allah's deen, their Iman is not greater than the Sahabas. So how in the world did none of the Sahabas uh, you, you need to stop. You're disturbing me. And you're doing it on purpose. No, I gave you everything you want. Please stop, okay? No. Okay, all right, listen. So he said that the Iman, that the, the Salaf, yes, the Salaf, their Iman. How come they never, ever ask this question about the Istanbul? It was mentioned seven times in the Quran. Not one Sahaba, we don't got one report from one companion during the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who ever asked the question, how Muhammad, how did Allah estow ala arsh? We don't got one report. That don't, that don't mean nothing? We ain't gonna stop there. Let's go, let's go further. Their students, the Tabi'een, who's the second best generation, we don't have one report from them. They, they even ask the question, how did Allah estow it? Then the third generation that comes after them, none of them made the question. And they read the same verse you read, sister. They know it better than you, sister. They committed it to memory. It was there when it was being revealed that they never asked once what did Allah mean and how did he meant that he is stole? That if you say he is stole, then you place them in a place. And if you say you place them in a place, you're giving them a body. And if you give them a body, you're giving them a direction. If you give them a confinement, they ain't going to none of that. They believe because if Allah said it, then we accept it. If Allah said he created Adam with his two hands, we accept it. We don't have to go into was his hands like ours? Do we have an organ? Is it veins? We don't have to go do we have eyes? Like we don't have to get into all that because that's playing. The Salaf they used to say about the people of the, of, 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 of the innovative Salaf, like the Mu'atazin, they say they are those who lie with deen. They play with their religion. So the response of Hassan Somali was correct. Not in his reply, but even in the way that he put the sister out. That was correct. As we see with Iman Malik. Because what she was doing, she was causing fitna by bringing shubha, doubt. That's something that is well known that never was asked about from the companions who are better than us. Also, it goes further than that. Sheikh Saleh Fazani brings a beautiful point. He quotes a hadith, I mean an ayat. Allah said, Al yawm wa akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum islam adina. 
Today I have perfected your religion. upon you my favor. And I have chosen for you, and I am pleased for you for your deen, al Islam. He said that this this ayah it has solidified, it has locked and sealed the message of Muhammad. That on the day of Arafah, on the farewell Hajj, the Prophet Sallallahu he said to the people that was there and that was in attendance, have I not conveyed the message? And he said this three times, which is from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, saying things twice. He said that what? I have not conveyed the message, looking up, pointing his finger up towards the heavens. To have I not conveyed the message? And they all said, Naam, or they all said, Bala. Of course, O Messenger of Allah. So that means the deen was complete when Allah took Muhammad. So what you're saying in essence, when you come alone and say that Allah did not istawa, when you come alone and say how he istawa, when you come alone and say what was before the Arsh, when you come alone and bring all of these misconceptions and all of this crazy ideology, when you come alone, you are indirectly saying that the Prophet did not complete his mission. You are indirectly saying that the Prophet ﷺ did not fulfill his mission. You are indirectly saying that the Prophet ﷺ has betrayed his message. He has completed it. There is a principle we understand. There is no good except that he has called his ummah to that good. And there is no evil except that this evil. There is no evil except that he has warned his ummah from that evil. He said, Well, Khairu Ladi Dalla Ali, and the good that he called him to was at Tawheed, with Jamiru Ma Yuhibuhu Allahu wa Yaradah, and everything that Allah loves and is pleased with. Was Sharru Ladi Haddaramin, and the evil that he put more than from is Shirk. With Jamiru Ma Yakrahu wa Yaba, and everything that Allah hates and displeased and detests. This is a principle with us. Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. The Prophet ﷺ done his job. Then you are saying that the companions, Indirectly, this is what you're saying. You are better than them. You're saying you are better. The people who got a tesquia, brothers and sisters, from who? They got a tesquia from Allah, the highest tesquia you can get. You know how someone says so and so is, is a real good student. You have a teacher who might vouch or validate another student. That teacher might say, you know what, he surpassed, he's excellent. Please, are you? He's excellent, he surpassed, he did what he's supposed to. He did everything he's supposed to. Yes, are you please? He did everything that he's supposed to. Everything. So I want to say that he graduated with honors. I vouch for this person. What is the highest tasqiyah you can get from God? Allah Jalla gave the companions, the tabi'een, the atba'a tabi'een, brothers and sisters, in the ayat, Allah said, Radi Allahu anhu wa radu an. They are pleased with Allah and Allah is pleased with them. Allah said this about the companions. He said about the tabi'een, the atba'a tabi'een. He said about them in the ayat in Surah Tawbah, and those who follow you in goodness. Allah has given them a tazkiyah. He has not given that to us. The validation comes from Allah. They are the best of people. So you mean to tell me you figure something out that you have a question that you have that they didn't, act, they didn't beat us to? There was some good that there was out there that exists that they didn't ask or they didn't think about? Look what this is implying. This is how deep this stuff goes. Stop being amazed with yourself. Allah said, Allah says the Surah Furqan, those who do not hope for the meeting with us, they say, why is not the angel sent down with you, O Muhammad? Why the angels didn't come to us? Oh, how, why did we do not see our Lord? Allah said, لَقَدْ اِسْتَكْبَرُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ They have what? They think too highly of themselves. They are so arrogant that they think too highly of themselves. This sister of misguidance, she think in self-amazement of herself. She had a nerve to go on a show to speak and to reiterate and repeat this false and misguided belief 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not istawa ala arsh. We're not talking about the fact that if a person who deny one verse in the Quran or one letter in the Quran is a kafir. We're not even going into that. As for the ulama to place takfir, I mean for Allah and His Messenger, and the ulama to come with the evidence. We're not even going into that. That's how deep it goes. Not the fact that if you deny the verse, but we want to go to the fact that what makes you think you don't even understand your own body? You don't understand your own anatomy. You can't even explain your own anatomy. You don't even know it down to the molecules, down to the detail about your own body. You don't even know about your death, when you're going to die. You can't even predict it. You don't even know about the ruh, the soul that you have. As Allah said, yes, aluna ka the ruh. They ask you, Muhammad about the ruh, about the soul, about the spirit. Say that the knowledge that's been given to you, mankind, was only but a few. You only been given a little bit of knowledge about it. You don't even know about your soul. But you have the audacity, the arrogance to speak about Allah. Before I let you go, I wanted to mention this point. Iman Ahmed, he says, لا يوصف الله إلا بما وصف به نفسه ووصف به رسوله لا يتجاوز القرآن والحديث He said that Iman Ahmed says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be described except what he described himself with or what his messenger described himself with not exceeding the Quran and the Hadith meaning the Quran and the Sunnah Shaykh Rathaymin he comments on this statement he says that this means that we do not describe Allah okay now I'm adding this here we do not call Allah the man upstairs please brothers and sisters stay away from that saying the man upstairs okay Allah never called himself a man and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not referred to as a man that's not his attribute nor as his name we do not call him the man upstairs okay Stay away from them. He said that we do not describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described himself with in his book, the Quran, and upon the tongue of his messenger in the hadith. He said, and this can be indicated and be proved to us by three means. By the Quran, by the aql, and by the sunnah. He said, as far as the Quran, it is the statement of Allah Jalla wa ala in Surah Al-A'raf. The second longest surah in the Quran, the seventh chapter of the Quran. Okay, you sit back, please. All right, he says, Kul you, you have to stop disturbing me. Yes, you can have some. Okay, go ahead, put it back. He says, What? He says, Say, O Muhammad, that your Lord only prohibit you from fawahisha, from fornication, adultery, and all types of lewd. And listen back, ma zahara minha, that which is apparent and that which is hidden. Wal ithm from sin, wal baghi from transgressing without due right. Wa an tushriku billahi ma lam yunazil bihi sultani. And to join partners with Allah and that which He have sent you down no authority. To commit shirk. And then Allah said at the end of this beautiful verse that He prohibit you from wa an taqulu ala Allahi ma la ta'alamun. Ibn al Qayyim, he says about this verse, brothers and sisters, if we don't know this, we need to know this. What is greater than shirk? In this verse, Allah tells Muhammad to tell the people what has been prohibited from them, from their Lord. And Ibn al-Qayyim said that the way that the verse is set up, that it meant that that which is less graver has been placed in front, and that which is more graver is more worse, or that is worse, is placed at last. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned shirk, then he mentions something after shirk. It's to speak about Allah without no knowledge. That's graver and worse than shirk. To talk about Allah without no knowledge. How can you find a person have the audacity? We see Abu Bakr, he didn't even want to give his opinion about the book of Allah. Right? Then we, okay, you, yes. Okay, he didn't even want to give his opinion about the book of Allah. Yet we have people who comes up and talks about Allah. Please, Ayyub, go in there. Thank you. Yes, go in there. Thank you. Yes. You understand? So he's saying that we have to understand that speaking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without no knowledge whatsoever is when you want to talk about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attributes is, what he can be described with, what is his names. You can't even worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without Allah sending revelations. You have to understand that the books were sent down for a reason. The messengers were sent for a reason. Allah didn't leave it to our intellect because we can't explain. Just imagine if He left it to our intellect. If Allah would not send down any revelation, think about that. Then anybody would want to describe Allah how they want to describe. We got the feminist movement right now. What do they say? 
You got people out there talking about God, God is a woman. And they argue you down. How are you going to tell me God is not a woman? Who are you to say what God is and what God is not, right? That would be chaos. It would be chaotic if someone to come tell you God is this and God is that. No, Allah didn't lead us. <laughs> he didn't leave us in the chaos. So he sent us revelation to explain explicitly by the words of his messengers, on the tongue of his messengers, how to properly understand him, how to properly worship, properly worship him, how to understand his attributes and his sifat. He sent that down. And we have to utilize that because he knows best about himself and others. We don't know about him. So for the sister to actually literally deny the istawa and try to use one verse amongst seven verses, which he did not even go into that. And not, we didn't even get into the fact that istawa in itself, the word istawa has 14 different meanings in the Arabic language. Some scholars say 17, but they all revert back to urlu, okay? Loftiness and arising and arisen. We didn't even get into all of that. Because like, that's, that's a mute point to me. I'm going to start at the beginning. If the Sahabas didn't ask about it and they greater than us, and if the Tabi'een didn't ask about it and they greater than us, and the Atba Tabi'een didn't ask about it and they greater than us, if they didn't make a fuss about it, I'm not. Why? If they didn't ask about it in the verses we revealed during that time, I'm not making a fuss about it. And I know that my intellect is deficient. Not the Sadiq, this is why we have this. We have to realize that we are in the time, and alhamdulillah, he mentioned that verse, and I'm gonna end it real quick because I don't like the, the ram one. I like to use proof. He mentioned something else, another verse. He says, so from this first verse we mentioned from Araf, إِذَا وَصَفْتَ اللَّهِ بِسِيفَةً لَمْ يَصِفَ اللَّهُ بِيَا نَفْسَ فَقَالْ دَكُوتَ عَلَيْهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمْ وَهَذَا مُحَرَّمْ مِنْ نَصِ الْقُرْآنِ So he brought a beautiful point that we all need to understand. He said that, so whenever you describe Allah with a quality or an attribute that He did not describe Himself with, then indeed you have spoken about Allah without what? Without knowledge. And this is haram according to the text of the Qur'an. We just seen the verse. To say by Allah that what you do not know. Allah also said, Do not speak about Allah or do not follow nothing that you have no knowledge of. Because indeed the what? Allah said the hearing and the seeing and the hearts, all of them will be questioned, concerned. Allah will question those things. So you cannot ask, do not follow nothing you have no knowledge of. The Shaykh, he said, so if we was to describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that which he has not described himself, then we follow something, or we were to follow something we don't have no knowledge concerning him, then we would have felt into that which Allah has prohibited us in these two verses. Okay? Then he mentioned as far as the intellect. Remember we said that there's proof by the Qur'an. We just showed you the two verses from the Qur'an. Now we're going to use the proof of the aql. He said the proof from the aql, the reasoning or the rationale, is that the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are from the fears of the, of the unseen. And it is not possible to comprehend the affairs of the unseen with the aql alone. He said, therefore, we do not describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with something that he did not describe himself with, nor do we ask how his attributes are, because that is impossible. Okay? He said, like for now, he said, like now, in the present day, we do not understand what Allah has described, how Allah has described, what He has described with, with the delights of paradise, whereas the reality of them, even though they are similar in name to the creation. In Jannah, we know that there will be fakiha, there will be fruits, right? There will be date palms. It will be all types of things that are named similar to that we know in this creation, but it won't be the same. It won't be the same. They might share the same name, but that don't mean they're going to be the same in essence and appearance and how they look and so forth and so on. We don't know. So because we don't know, just because we have the name, it don't mean how. He said, because Allah said, فَلَا تَعْلَمُوا نَفْسُ مَا أُكْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ عَيُّنٍ جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Allah said, no soul knows what is hidden for them. you you keep disturbing me, please. I'm doing something. Yes, you're kidding. Okay, all right, so, Jazakallah Khan. So, he says that no one be, um, no one mentioned. 
Jazakallah khair. If you got children, how many of the Prophet said they what? They could be a, they could be a fitna. He used to be on the minbar giving the khutbah and Hasna and, and Hussein used to run up and he would pick them up and you know they would they would disturb the khutbah and the Prophet said that didn't Allah say innama awladukum wa fitna? Didn't he say that indeed for amongst your children? That your children and your wealth is only a fitna for you. So I'm not being mean, I'm just saying that they can be a fitna when you're trying to get something done. But anyway, Allah said, for that Did no one say that they can be a fitna for you? Did no soul know what is hidden for them? Right? Or Did no soul know what is hidden for them? Right? Or nor I have seen as a recompense or a reward for that which they used to do. Sure, such. Then Allah says in the Hadith Qudsi, I have prepared for my servants, my righteous servants, what no eye has never seen. Nor any ear had ever heard, nor any heart can conceive or, 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 or imagine. Right? Alhamdulillah, right? None of them. So if this is the understanding, he's using these narrations to show us what? That for either canaf hada fil makruku la di wasa fi sifata ma'luma ma'ana wala ta'lam haqiqataha. He says, so if it's the case regarding the creation, right? That there are descriptions or attributes that are well known, right? However, we do not know their reality, then how are you? You're, are you? Stop. You're man of fitting, okay? Stop. Just, just play with what you're playing with. Your toys, okay? He says, so if we don't know their reality, then how so are we going to know about the Creator? How can a person have the audacity to sit up there and argue with you back and forth about whether or not Allah rose above the throne? Allah said it in seven different places. Why I'm going to argue with you about Allah keeps saying, Thumas the wa'ala arsh. Yudabbiru amr. Why I'm going to sit... Why? Why would I argue when Allah said it seven times? Just, he didn't say it once. So now you want to get confused. And I, I didn't mention this earlier, but I'm going to mention it now. Allah didn't leave nothing out. <laughs> in Surah Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says something very imperative to understand in His book. Again, Allah didn't leave nothing out. To understand his book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa anzawna alaykal kitab. And we have sent down to you, Muhammad, the book. And from amongst the book are ayat muhkamat that are clearly and explicitly clear. And they are the umul kitab, they are the mother of the book. But then he said, Ayyub, there are other ayats from the book that are mutashabiha, that are not so entirely clear. Pay attention to this. You please, I'm trying to explain something. Please, are you? Are you? Just go, you have everything in front of you, please. Just like okay, you have everything in front of you. Okay, you're not missing nothing. Okay, go find it. Just don't be in my way. Just like okay. So then he says, in this verse, he teaches something. And I'll let him run. Okay, are you? In this verse, he said there are verses that are not entirely clear. He said, فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغَ I want you to pay attention now. As for those in whose heart there is deviation. <laughs> Law don't leave nothing up. As for those in whose heart there are deviation. The Prophet ﷺ didn't leave nothing up. For years, the Prophet ﷺ was singing his khutbah to Hajj. What would he say? فَإِنَّ الشَّرَّ أمور what? The worst affairs are what? Newly invented matters. And every newly invented matter is a bid'ah. And every bid'ah is a dalala. And every dalala is in the null. <laughs> Why would the Prophet keep saying this and during this time it wasn't no innovation? Why did he keep saying over and over and repeating over and over and during his time it wasn't no innovation? Innovation didn't show his ugly head until the time of who? After when Umar ibn Khattab was martyred. So why? Because Allah, the Prophet ﷺ knew the grave and the severity, severity of innovation and the harm that it would cause. So Allah says in this verse, as for those who have vague deviation, are you, you're disturbing me, go over there. No. For those who have deviation in their hearts, then what? They are going to what? They are going to seek out. They're going to seek out those verses that are not entirely clear. Sheikh Salih Fuzan said the golden rule, the principle of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that we refer back the mutashabiha to the muhkami. We refer back the verses that are not entirely clear to those verses that are, are clear. 
The verses that are clear are dealing with Allah's commands and His prohibitions. Dealing with those things that Allah subhanahu wa explicitly said, they are entirely clear. And the verses that are not entirely clear, that have deeper meanings, Allah gave some of the people understanding of them on different levels. Okay, those who are rasikhuna fil ilm, those who are well grounded in knowledge. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, as for those who believe, then they believe in all of it. All of it. They say all of it is from Allah. Kullu, all of it is from our Lord. Okay? This is the belief system that we have. Then Allah didn't stop there after this verse. Are you please? Yes. He said, he said so and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not do what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not do what? He said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِبْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِنْ حَدَيْتَنَا وَأَبَدَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ وَحَابٍ Then Allah sent a dua that we should say, Oh Allah, do not cause our heart to deviate after you have guided us. Allahu Akbar. So, are you please? Allahu Akbar. So those, those things, are you go back in here? You're being are you? You're being disrupted. Go back in here, please. So those things, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said a dua that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do not cause our heart to deviate. This can happen to any one of you brothers if you're not firmly grounded in your deen. If you're not firmly grounded in your aqidah. Last but not least, we're gonna end there. We're gonna end inshaAllah ta'ala. I think we mentioned everything pretty much is understood. I know y'all thought this was gonna be me calling a sister out of her name. I'm not going to do that. Uh, she is misguided. Uh, we're not going to take our time out to bash her. Um, because it's really not about her. We're not trying to bring fame about her. It's about our understanding. And I really do want to take a time out to censor us. If you are a person, and I think this is harmful, and it has been harmful. And I, Allah, I stick by this, and I take this to my grave. Wearing Salafia as a badge. Running around with a stamp of the word Salafi. Promoting it to everybody. We're Salafi. Screaming it from our lungs and from the stands and from the bleaches. We're Salafi. We're the ones with the correct Akita, such etc. Et et it had become a hujja alina. And it becomes a proof against us. The people who truly adhere to Dawah to Salafi, they're not screaming it from the top of their lungs. The people who are here truly to the Dawah to Salafi and understand it properly, they're, they're not the ones who's running around attaching it to their name at the end of their name. They're not going out of their way to make it known because their character and their actions are already doing it. You don't see none of the ulama. Are we? Are we? You don't see not one scholar of truth doing this. They don't make their events Salafi. They don't call their Eids Salafi. They don't call their lectures Salafi. They don't call their places Salafi. Are we? We was in Egypt, never saw it. We was in Mecca, in Medina, never saw it. Are we? This mindset has become a hujja. Sheikh Salih Fuzari said that. The person who strive as Salafi to his name, he's praising himself. He said, this is, haram. He said, this is haram. You are making a, a tazkiyah to yourself. Now you're going to have to live up to it. Sister comes down to the Dawah Center, she calls some corruptions, and everyone waiting for Somali to answer. As if they couldn't deal with the issue themselves. And they're confused with the sister, she's doing this and she's doing that. Following this one and following that one. Like, come on, when are you going to learn yourself? One of the things that take you out of the fold of Islam, the tenth thing, matter of fact, is neglecting to learn about the deen of Allah. That Sheikh Muhammad the Wahhab placed in his book, Nawaq al Islam. It's neglecting to learn about the deen of Allah. The average base knowledge you should have is the tenets of Iman, yourself. You don't need a Somali to come along to teach you that. You don't need the student so alone for land and our land to come teach you the basis of your deen that you're supposed to have. You believe in Allah, you believe in the Messenger, you should have the Hadith of Jibril memorized. There are many books that have been rendered into the English language with explanations of that hadith. Why you don't know it? Hadith of Ibn Umar that's mentioned after it. You should have memorized, complete. Because that teaches your deen. 
It mentioned talatatu maratu, three levels of your deen. It's mentioned in the hadith. Jibril came to teach you your deen. He taught you about the pillars of Islam. He taught you about the arakan of Iman. He taught you about the arakan, the rukn wahid, the one arakan, the pillar of Ihsan. The three levels of your deen that you should be fluent. And we're not. Our Iman is shaky. We have doubt when someone come talk to us like this. Oh, that do make sense. Kaif! How do it make sense? Yeah, you see? You can't say Allah have a body. See, that makes sense. So you can't say Allah have this. That makes sense. Kaif! Because we are caught up with appearances and association. I'm associated with so-and-so masjid. My Akita check. I'm straight. No, you're not. The man written down the creed of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah from Zohar to Arthur, one of the most prolific books that we have to our time that can be attested to. And if we were asked to write down the creed of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah just from memory, from Zohar to Arthur right now, we can't do it. Even including me, I'm the speaker. We can't do it. Just try to test yourself one time. Once you take a half an hour to write down the creed of Ahlul Sunnah, don't go to none of your library, don't open none of your books. I don't want you to go to the Quran, I don't want you to go to nothing. You can't quote the verse. You can't even mention the verse number. You can't even quote the hadith. It's going to be stagnant and fragmented. What are we doing? Yes, the scholars, they said what? What did the scholars say? The scholars said the knowledge are you. Knowledge is what? Knowledge is anything that you cannot do what? Hun, are you, please. They said that knowledge is nothing you cannot go to the bathroom with. Meaning that it should be in your breast. The basics. So don't come quoting Shahr Baba Harvey to me. I don't want to hear it. Sorry, brothers and sisters. I might, I actually might. I'm going to scream you. Yes, I am. I don't want to hear Shahr Baba Harvey. I don't want to hear Shahr Sunnah. Even Baba Hari book, I don't want to hear it. Don't start quoting to me how my Masjid Aqsa being off it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear about how Masjid Furqan is off it. I don't want to hear it. How Masjid Fulan and Alan is off it. I don't want to hear it. Don't come to me with that. Because you cannot explain who is the Salaf. You don't even know who they are. Give me their lineage. Break it down. Give me five Salaf from the companions. Five Salaf from the Tabi'een. I want their lineage with it. Five Salaf from the Atba'a Tabi'een. Give it to me. Their lineage. Where did they study? Who did they study with? Who did they learn from? Who was their teachers? What was their students? What books did they offer? Their acts of worship. Their character. Give it to me. You can't. So I don't want to hear about the innovation of Fulan and Alan. When one puny sister, she don't even know what she's talking about, can come up and show up at the dollar center and cause a career and the people passing around and passing around, it's going viral. One sister who don't know nothing what she's talking about. She can't even properly recite the Arabic. Can't even recite the verse correctly. She's a rapper. And you in commotion over that. And you want to sit here and come back and back and back and forth talking about what? You want to come back and forth talking about what? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us, man. We gotta stop with this appearance stuff. You wanna impress yourself? Learn about the Dawah to Salafia. Don't put on a lecture and post it on the gram. Don't put on a lecture and post it on Facebook. Listen to it yourself. Write down notes. Go back and listen to it again. Learn some more. Write down some more notes. Go back and listen to it again. Write down some more notes. And then go out and practice it. It's just that simple. Do that first. Then spread it. And then you will never be confused when someone come talking about Allah didn't rise above his throne. What you talking about, sister? Allah said this in six other places. What you talking about, sister? Allah said this in this other places. The hadith says this. Huh? The Salaf said this about it. What you talking about, sister? You will be able to answer. You wouldn't be waiting for a student to come along to answer something you should already know. It's a shame, bro. It's a shame, brothers and sisters, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to really give us our creed and let us understand the tenets of our faith. Let's truly, Allah, please teach us our creed and our faith. And this is the month of Ramadan. Take your time out to really learn the Quran. And inshallah ta'ala, try to memorize, especially if you can, memorize Juz Amma. Juz Amma have a lot of Aqidah in it, brothers and sisters, if you don't know. Get to Tafsir Ibn Sa'adi. He, he highlights the Aqidah points that need to be pointed out and that's alluded to. And it's also rendered in the English language. Learn about your deed. Please. Please. And be afraid to run around and say you're Salafi. Sheikh Fozan, 
He said that what? I'm Salafi, insha'Allah. Insha'Allah. Be afraid running around saying you Salafi. Don't, don't associate your ilk with the pious people. Don't. You want to be associated with the pious people? Follow them. Live up to it. But be afraid when you say I'm Salafi. Now I'm not saying be afraid and don't say that you don't follow the Dawah to Salafi. That's not what I'm saying. I want no one to misconstrue that. I'm saying when you want to embody this and you want to tell people I'm Salafi, be afraid. But if you want to say yes, I follow the Quran and the Sunnah according to the understanding of the Sahabas to the best of my ability and I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make me Salafi one day, inshallah, that I'll become true Salafi al jet then that best. Love us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us wherever we said that was incorrect in our translation and even in the quotes of the ayats and the hadith. And if anything that we said that was wrong, that wasn't intended by any of the scholars that we quoted from their verse or their words, and we are not a scholar, um, we are real humble, if you want to say a student of knowledge, a beginner. We're at the very beginning level. I don't even like to use the term tolerable ilm to myself. So we just wanted to share whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed us to share. And we want to stay clear of people like that. When you come across that sister again, do not entertain her. Do not. Iman Shafi made a beautiful statement. He said what? He said, I never won an argument with a fool. Sheikh Fuzan said that a fool is knockus al aqal. Someone who is deficient in aqal. Okay, yes. Ayub Shafi said, I have never won an argument with a fool. You cannot win an argument with someone who's not, who's not properly, who doesn't have a full deck. Okay, you, please, are you, you have to go back in there, please. You cannot do what? You cannot win an argument with a people who are not working with a full, complete deck. This is why it's a principle. If you want to teach something, and this is my rights to the students, from the scholars' advice, this ain't even Nafi's advice, but from the scholars' advice, teach Usul Sunnah. Don't teach Shah Sunnah. Teach Usul Sunnah, Iman Ahmed. Teach the book until, 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 until the pages fall off, until the binder is ripped. Teach Usul Sunnah. Teach Akira to Wasatiyah. Teach Kashra Shubahat. Teach these books, Kitab al Tawheed. Teach these books until the people have it and it's firmly locked. Don't teach them Shah Sunnah. We don't know. We're still trying to get over our sins. And you over there trying to shove down our face that so-and-so is an enemy. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. La ashadu wa la la'an astakulu wa atubi ilayk. Jazakallah khayyam wa khuwa. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.